So, I'm Spencer Danielson. I'm a professor of geography at Silver Rock University. I also run Mapsburg with an H on it, like Pittsburgh, uh, which is my website for selling uh, fantasy style cartography. And so, as a, a geographer and a cartographer, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about constructing the map of Middle Earth, fan cartography's engagement with Tolkien's legendarium. And so, this talk and being here at MythMoo kind of brings my career full circle because I read Lord of the Rings for the first time when I was in the third grade. And, you know, I loved it in all respects, but I especially loved the map. And I was just like sit there looking at that map in the front uh, of the book, if you can advance to the next one there. Um, and just like imagining what this place was, and I started drawing maps of my own, like covered the walls of my uh, bedroom with them. And so I went on to uh, major in geography, I got my PhD in geography, I got a position teaching in geography, and through most of that career I ended up, uh, my research area was, uh, and, and still is, uh, wildfire management. Um, and I've so presented on that a whole bunch of times, and so now that I have tenure, it's an opportunity to try out new projects, right? new things. And so I'm kind of circling back around now uh, to looking at uh, maps in fantasy literature and what they tell us about how people think about maps and about geography. So, uh, next slide there. Um, and if I could get, to get the, oops, hang on, go back. Hmm. Yes, there was a okay. there was a problem with the file that okay. must have been lost. Okay, so there there was all kinds of cool text on here. Um, <laughs> giving the kind of point of view that I want to take in this uh, presentation, which is to look at maps as texts, and so I'm drawing on a kind of research tradition that's called critical cartography, and the basic idea here is that we often look at maps as kind of objective windows on the world, right? Whatever's on the map is just telling us exactly what's out there in uh, real life. But as I always tell my students in my uh, intro geography classes, that we should think of maps as a simplification of the Earth's surface for a particular purpose. So every map is made by somebody coming from a particular cultural context with a particular agenda of what they're trying to tell us with this map. And they're going to make choices in putting that map together based on those kind of factors. And to really understand what a map is showing us, we need to understand who made it, why did they make it, and you know, what does that say about the things that are there on uh, the surface of this map. And for maps, I, I had a quote up here from a uh, geographer, Jan Brook, who pointed out that not only are maps constructed like this, but maps tend to hide their own constructiveness. It's uh, easier to look at a, a written text and see the authorship of it, to uh, you know, infer who is writing this and what's their, the agenda that they're uh, bringing to this, whereas for a, uh, a map, that tends to get hidden. And so we tend to assume that the map is just this objective representation of the Earth that, uh, that it's not. So, next slide here. And so, I want to first say a, a bit about how Tolkien himself related to his maps. And so, he famously said in letter 137, For of course, in such a story, one cannot make a map for the narrative, but must first make a map, map and make the narrative agree. And for any of us that have read the History of Middle Earth series, we know that that quote is basically backwards from his actual practice. Right? He wrote the story, and he kept changing and changing the map to keep up with the story. And you know, you see there the um, sort of diagram that Christopher Tolkien presents us of all the different pieces that were pasted together as he kept changing things, especially in kind of the middle course of the Anduin, where he was constantly rearranging the geography. Uh, but in either case, right, whether you draw the map first and then write the story for the map, or write the story and then make a map of it, he's treating the map in this kind of objective way. The map shows the real geography of Middle Earth. It's like a reference material. Right? Um, so it's a very modern kind of conception of the map, even though it has this medieval aesthetic of the little pictures of the mountains and trees and stuff, right? Tolkien himself is treating his maps as just this objective set of facts about the geography of Middle Earth, whether he's drawing the map first or, or last. So next slide there. 
And so I want to kind of contrast the way that the maps are treated in the legendarium with the way that the written texts are treated. Because for our written texts, Tolkien is very explicit about their provenance, where they came from, who wrote them, right? The Lord of the Rings, he gives this whole uh, description of how he's translating this edition of the Red Book and gives this like long textual history to it. With the Silmarillion, we know that it's coming originally from things like or written by Pengeloth and Gondolin and so forth. Uh, so you know, we have this idea of these texts as being created by particular people from within the world, and we can think about what they're telling us in the context of who we know writing them, when they're being written, etc. Now, when it comes to maps, we know that there are maps in Middle-earth, right? right? In, the, in The Hobbit, uh, we find out that Bilbo himself is a lover of maps. Uh, so cartography exists in Middle-earth. But the maps that we have of Middle-earth are not given the same kind of uh, textual history or provenance. We're not told who drew these, why did they draw them, uh, you know, what's the, the cultural context for the maps that we have. The maps are just there. Uh, and advance to the next slide and there. And so I, I will kind of make a note and uh, I'm gonna, not gonna, gonna say as much as I could say about this in the interest of time. Make note that Thor's map in The Hobbit is kind of the exception to this rule, right? With this map, we know who drew it. We know about the cultural context of its creation. It even appears in the story. The characters like hold it in their hands. Um, but it's kind of the exception that proves the rule, right? We don't have that kind of understanding of things like the big map of Northwestern Middle Earth that we saw at the beginning of uh, the, the presentation here. So next slide. So I want to look at how the fan community approaches cartography in Middle-earth and kind of compare it to the way the fan community approaches the written text that we have. And so I'm drawing on this idea from Don Wallstuma of Historio Canon. And so she says, Historio Canon is the process by which some authors challenge, and this is authors of like fan fiction uh, that she's writing about, some authors challenge the texts and develop interpretations that do not take the texts at face value. Historio Canon justifies deviating from the texts where historiographical analysis causes concern about authorial bias or inaccuracy. So, in other words, a lot of people in the fan community have embraced this idea that, you know, Lord of the Rings, for example, is this document from within the world. And it's written by particular people in the world. And so, rather than treating it as a set of facts about Middle-earth, we treat it as a historical document from Middle-earth that we can criticize and, you know, read between the lines in the same way we read between the lines of historical documents from our own world, the same way that Tolkien would read between the lines of things like Beowulf or the Finsburg fragment and so forth. So this is a, a very popular thing that a lot of fans do. And to kind of illustrate that, I have two quotes uh, that I found on uh, Tumblr. So the first one from uh, Misbehaving Maiar says, I guess what I'm saying is, when you see me furiously typing screeds about colonialism and competent antagonists and elven propaganda while shoving the book into my flaming maw and bellowing, know that it's because it is my favorite book, and that is how I express gratitude. Um, and I, th this particular post this comes from is one of my favorite posts about Tolkien fandom, right? But this, this historical canon idea, right? This person is like, I'm going to write about how Lord of the Rings is elven propaganda. I'm going to rethink what we know based on the idea that this is constructed text from within uh, the world. And so some of the things that it says may not be, you know, quote unquote, true about uh, Middle Earth or may give us a different, give us just one point of view that we might have, right? An incomplete picture because it's one person's uh, perspective when, when writing this. And then in kind of contrast, uh, another Tumblr user, user Vardas Vapor says, my loathing of agenda-driven canon events were false narrative head canons, or snide just an idea bots, is at least 50 times more blindingly strong than literally any other Tolkien discourse in existence. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's obviously a very common thing that people are writing Tumblr posts complaining about this kind of historio canon things being taken to extremes. And uh, I will say, as an apology to Vardas Vapors and anybody else that liked that post, if they ever see this presentation, I am one of the worst offenders in this respect. So, you know, if afterwards you want to come talk to me about uh, my theory that Gandalf actually died for good in Moria and never came back, or my theory that Saruman was actually the good guy in the Rohan sequence, uh, you know, I, I love, like, taking this idea to an extreme and, you know, coming up with bizarre reinterpretations 
based on you know the idea that there's this bias or you know particular perspective to the texts uh, that we have. So you know we've got this idea about the written texts, and the fan community has really embraced that. So what I want to look at is what they've done with the maps. You know, have we taken this historical canon point of view on the maps of Middle Earth? So next slide. So I went on the website DeviantArt and uh, just did a search for Middle Earth map to get a whole bunch of different fan maps. And I've been accumulating fan maps and uh, and so forth for a while, but I wanted like a, a kind of a you know a, a big sample of stuff to work with uh, for this particular presentation. Uh, and so I, I grabbed anything I saw that that showed basically the area covered by uh, Christopher's map that we saw uh, back at the beginning. Uh, that was roughly congruent with that in its uh, scale. It got rid of things that weren't weren't really fan redrawings of maps of Middle Earth that were like you know took existing maps and you know did a, a wood burning of it or or made it into a cell phone case or something like that. Um, and I ended up with 57 maps that I worked with for this presentation. I've continued to download more. Um, as kind of a, a tedious process of downloading all these and keeping track of where they came from and who, who made them, but the, the additional stuff hasn't changed my uh, conclusions here. So the first thing to note is that none of the maps that I found gave any explicit indication of provenance. None of them said, this is a map that would have been drawn by so-and-so from such and such place. Uh, the, at most, they, you know, they tell you that it's at the end of the third age. Right? So the, the time period is, is relevant, although you know, it could have been drawn any time after that way. Right? That's, that's the time period being depicted in the map. So there's, there's no explicit indication of in-world origin for any of these uh, maps. So go to the next slide. <coughs> okay, so I now want to go through and look at some of the choices that people are making in how they put their maps together and to see how those are uh, reflected in the fan cartography. So uh, first one, very simple choice, but again, something that we often just kind of take for granted is the orientation of them, right? Which way is up? And so in Christopher's maps, north is up, consistent with you know what's common in our world. And so I have a whole bunch of fan maps and literally every single one is north oriented. Every single map that I found on uh, DeviantArt had north uh, up, and so those are just you know five examples of north being up on these maps. Even though, if you can go to the next slide there, we actually have a canonical piece of information that certain maps in Middle Earth aren't north oriented; they're actually east oriented. Right? He explicitly says in the Hobbit that dwarvish maps put put east at the top, just like Thor's map. Uh, that's in The Hobbit, and so this doesn't come from the Deviant Art sample. It's another one that I found. The only other fan map that I could find that was not north oriented um, comes from this person that calls himself the Dwarrow Scholar and is making a, an explicitly dwarven map of Middle Earth, and so he put east uh, at the top. And then if you can go to the next uh, slide there, this is one that I drew uh, not too long ago and kind of blew people's minds on Tumblr as it went around because. You know, I, I decided to take this historical canon kind of approach to the map, and I said, all right, so if we assume that the map, Christopher's map is like a, a redrawing, you know, a translation into English of a map that was actually part of the, the Red Book, what might that have looked like? And so we have a, a suggestion. You know, this, doesn't, this quote here from Appendix E doesn't explicitly say Elvish maps were West-oriented, but it kind of suggests it, especially when we compare that to the very similar comments he made about Dwarvish maps, where he went on to explicitly say they're East-oriented. And so I said, all right, let me draw a West-oriented map. And so all I did, I turned it sideways, and I uh, you know, wrote all the names in, uh, in Elvish there. But you know, it kind of blew some people's minds when I came around on, on Tumblr just to take that, that one step, changing that one choice about which direction is going to be up uh, on, on your map. So, uh, we go to the next slide. Okay, so another aspect that I looked at was the mountain ranges. And so, this is something that uh, Tolkien and uh, maps in uh, Lord of the Rings have often been criticized for, is that, well, the mountain ranges look unnatural. They're too straight, they make these like sharp right angles. Um, and I think it's most obvious when we look at Mordor. 
there's kind of like the mountains make this like box around Mordor. And there's this recent article on Tor.com by Alex Axe that like went on at length about how unnatural the mountains in Middle Earth are. And so in this picture, uh, he has actually like drawn uh, lines there to indicate this got cropped a little weird, I guess, when it came across uh, into the. I made this file on a, a Windows computer, and it's on a Mac now. So that's some of the things are a little funky here. But you know, he drew this box to show how how unnatural the mountains around uh, Mordor are. And you know, one thing to note in that article was you know, he's saying the maps are unnaturally the mountains are unnaturally straight on the map. That must mean the mountains are unnaturally straight in Middle Earth. And so I'm going to criticize the actual geography of Middle Earth based on the map. But these straight mountain ranges could very easily be seen as part of this medieval aesthetic. And so I've got an example there, that map by Sebastian Munster uh, of Greece and part of Turkey. It's actually from 1550, so it's like an early modern map. But you can see the mountain ranges there are very straight. Because when Munster's drawing this map, he's not interested in showing us the exact locations of each peak in these ranges. And right? he's giving us this conceptual diagram of how Greece is put together. And so we know that like, there's this mountain range down the center, and so he draws it straight up down uh, the center there. So it would be very easy, you know, if you're thinking in these terms about the maps in uh, Lord of the Rings to say, well, those straight mountains are a cartographic convention. That's not telling us exactly where each of these peaks are and that they happen to be laid out in a straight line. So I took a look, you know, using, using Mordor as the case study because the, you know, the mountains around it make such a, you know, a, a box in the original map. And if you can go to the next slide. So here's some examples of Mordor from some of my uh, sample of fan cartography. And what we see, and I, I haven't come up with a good way to like measure this, you know, like quantify the straightness of these mountains, but you can see uh, people are drawing mountains around Mordor as a little box. You know, in some cases, actually even straighter, like the uh, center of Ottoman, you know, even straighter and uh, sharper angles than Christopher's map. And this goes not only for the ones like you see most of these are in that medieval kind of style, have little pictures of mountains, but even maps that use a different aesthetic, so maps that are trying to, you know, in the case of the one in the upper left is one of several, that try to show Middle Earth as if it's like a satellite photo, right, as if you were on Google Earth or something. And yet you see the mountains are drawn as a straight little box. Right? So the, the author of that map treated the shape of the mountains on Christopher's map as just facts about the actual geography of Middle Earth. Uh, they didn't try to make the shape of them look any more realistic, even though they're using this like satellite imagery texture to uh, present it, rather than the little drawings uh, of mountains. Go to the next slide. Okay, so then another aspect that I took a look at here was what I'm calling the Forest of Rune. So this is something that appears on Christopher's map. It was actually on. Uh, his father's original map that he was basing things on, because of course Christopher never added anything of his own if he could help it. Right? So this is something that J.R.R. Tolkien put on his map, but we know literally nothing about it outside of the map. Right? It's never referenced in the text. Uh, as far as I can tell, text not only just the published text, but even any of the other materials that we've gotten you know, since his death, there's never even the slightest mention of this forest. Literally the only thing we know about it is when we look at the map that Christopher drew for uh, Lord of the Rings, there's this little forest around the northeastern side of the Sea of Rome. And when we think about this, you know, we're thinking about if we were trying to guess who in the world would have drawn this map, right? This is probably a map drawn either by a hobbit in the Shire, or maybe this is a map drawn by somebody in Gondor. And so those are pretty far away from this forest of Rune. It's really easy to imagine that they would have limited knowledge about what's actually out there in Rune, right? They, they didn't travel out there uh, very much. And in fact, if you look at uh, some, I should have put this in the slide here. If you look at medieval and even early modern European maps, look at the Caspian Sea. In real life, the Caspian Sea is kind of long north to south. Most medieval European maps showed it as this horizontal oval. So, and that's kind of you know similar distance away from the people making those maps. So, you know, 
in a, a medieval type of setting, you know, the accuracy of your understanding of the geography uh, falls off really sharp as you get away from the areas that your culture uh, inhabits. So again, if somebody was looking to reinterpret this map and to you know, show us different things, give us a different perspective, it'd be really easy to say, well, you know, I can, I can go crazy with stuff out there in Rune because it's probably totally inaccurate on the maps that we have if they were dri drawn in Gondor or in the Shire or something. But when we look at our fan cartography, we see the Forest of Rune in pretty much exactly the same dimensions that it appears on Christopher's map in nearly every instance. There were uh, a handful of maps that just eliminated the forest altogether. There was nobody that really like expanded it or moved it substantially. <coughs> um, they just, you know, they saw this forest on the map and they took that as, well, that's just factual data. This forest exists and it has these boundaries. And so I'm going to repeat that onto my map. Though I will note, we get a little bit of kind of uh, minor historical canon thinking here when we look at uh, the rivers going into the Sea of Rune. So you know, on the official map, we get one river, right, Kelduin coming in to the northwest, but you can see on several, like the two on the far right there, uh, it's not uncommon, it's not universal, but it's not uncommon that fans will decide, you know, there's all this empty space out here in Rune, I'm gonna fill it in a little bit. Maybe there's details that weren't on Christopher's map because they weren't important or weren't known to the people that would have drawn that, right? Because it's way outside of where our story goes. And so a common embellishment is to add rivers coming out of those two uh, eastern points on uh, the Sea of Rune. So we see a little bit of this kind of thinking peeking through in uh, that particular case. You'll notice as well that the mountains of Rune on the opposite side are there in nearly all cases. So again, people see this on the map and they're like, all right, well, it's got to go on my map because it must be just a fact about the geography uh, of Middle Earth. So we can get to the next slide there. So then the last uh, issue that I took a look at in examining these fan maps was projections. So this is a large enough area that if you are mapping the world, you really ought to be thinking about projections. Like how do we take the round earth, put it on a flat piece of paper? And of course, Middle Earth in the late third age is a round world. Uh, so we ought to be thinking about projections if we're going to make a, a real map of uh, this world. And you can see the, the examples there, right? how different our world looks with different map projections that each serve a different sort of purpose. Right? So the Mercator projection is a useful projection if you are a sailor navigating at sea because it's easy to find the compass angle that you should steer your ship in. Something like the, you know, the good Somala scene is good if you want to show the size of everything equal without distorting the shapes and you only care about the land. Right? So each of these, there's, there's reasons you might use this or that uh, projection. But not only is a projection not stated for Christopher's map that's the source of a lot of this, but in fact, it's in an impossible projection. So I have a quote here from uh, The Atlas of Middle Earth by Karen Wynne Fonstad, which I will say is sort of an epic achievement of uh, sort of non-critical cartography. And I mean that in a non-insulting way. Right? She's really embracing this idea that every single detail on the map is simply a fact about the geography of Middle Earth. And she's trying to pull all this together with all the other things that are ever mentioned in any of Tolkien's works and trying to compile this into a single consistent database. And I love this book. It's my absolute favorite secondary source about uh, Tolkien. But it, it very much avoids this question of critical cartography, of asking who made these maps and why. Um, but so she's looking at Christopher's map and she says, the maps of Middle Earth included in Lord of the Rings showed both a north arrow and a bar scale. This means that both distance and direction were considered to be accurate, an impossibility in mapping a round world. Right? You can't have a map that has both a north arrow that's always correct all, everywhere on the map and a distance scale. This is going to be correct everywhere on the map. That's just impossible. But the map has this. And so she says, Tolkien's world, at least after the change, was round, yet it appears to have been mapped as flat. The only reasonable solution is to map his maps, treating his world as if it were flat. So she basically gave up on this idea of trying to figure out what projection was Christopher's map in so that she could like reproject it uh, into whatever projection she wanted to use. She was just like, I'm just gonna treat this as a flat map because uh, you know it's, it's in this impossible projection. I would have to challenge either the north arrow or the distance scale or both if I were going to uh, you know, try to treat this as a, a projection. So you go to the next slide there. Uh, so 
As I said, none of the fan maps that I found explicitly stated a projection, right? or even a made-up projection. Um, you know, they didn't say anything about that. But I wanted to look a bit at, at how the proportions of things on the map were uh, dealt with. And so I took a look at Christopher's map, and I found three locations where we had a you know, nice uh, horizontal or vertical uh, distance that came out to exactly 800 miles according to his scale there. So I have from Lake Town to the far side of Lake Enidim, I have from the Lonely Mountain down to the spot where that little spur off the Eiffel Duaf comes out, uh, and I have from Mount Doom to the west coast of Gondor. So all of those, according to Christopher's map, are exactly 800 miles. So the ratio between any two of those things on Christopher's map is 1. Uh, it's a, an equal ratio. And so I measured those things on these 57 fan maps. Um, and so you can see the, the range there. So here we actually see a, a variety of different shapes. People squished and stretched this map in some interesting kind of ways. So you see like the A to B ratio. The, so the averages for all of them are pretty close to one. And most and they, they average pretty close to what uh, Christopher's proportions. But there's quite a lot of variation. So I think the A to B ratio ranges from 1.2 to 0.62. The A to C goes from 1.69 to 0.65. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I've got a couple examples of sort of the extremes of the A to C ratio. And so you can see these two maps. So this one is kind of stretched very tall north to south. Um, so the you know that north to south distance gets much larger. And that one is kind of squished down or maybe stretched side to side. Um, so we get some different proportions happening. But these, the different proportions seem to be mostly driven by artistic considerations. Right? What's the space I want to fill with this map? Um, what do I want to make it look like? It's not based on you know, a historical canon kind of analysis of you know, who might have drawn this map, what projection might I be kind of uh, inferring it uh, into. And so as kind of a, a counterexample to use another uh, a personal fan cartography project, go to the next slide, um, I actually took Christopher's map and I pulled it into a program called G Projector that allows you to change the projection of a map. I treated his map as uh, what's called an equirectangular projection, where a degree of latitude or longitude is the same distance on the map wherever it is. It's a common default format uh, for geographical data. And so I said, here's what it would look like if you took that and reprojected it to a Mercator projection. Here's what it would look like if we put it as a, a equal area conic projection, which is probably the most common projection that you would see for a map of, say, Europe or of the United States. Right? It's usually in something like that Albers equal area conic projection. Um, and this gives us a very different sort of idea of what Middle Earth might look like when we, when we put it into these different uh, projections. When we're really thinking about what does it mean to map a round Earth in uh, late third age. So, for my conclusion, so kind of my, my, my conclusion to GR first is that this uh, kind of validates that uh, comment by Jan Broek that uh, maps kind of hide their own constructiveness, that people tend to take maps as just factual information about the world, don't think about who made this, why did they make this, what was their agenda, what did they know and what might they not have known. Uh, for literary scholars, this is kind of an encouragement to view these maps as texts uh, and analyze them in the same way that we look at the written texts. And for fans, uh, I think this is a, a really interesting area, at least to me as a geographer, right, a really interesting area for these transformative fan works. Like, what might the maps that people in Middle Earth make have really looked like? How would different societies in Middle Earth have mapped? their world. And as kind of a far out suggestion there, this is actually a mold that someone made by pouring uh, molten aluminum into an abandoned anthill. But I was like, maybe that's what dwarven maps of their tunnels look like, right? Because you can't put that on a flat thing. Maybe they have these like intricate 3D things that they make. Who knows? Um, but uh, it would be really exciting to see, you know, fans really engage this kind of idea about the maps and see different perspectives on the geography of Middle Earth. So, thank you. All right, okay. thanks so much. So, we have about a minute until we have to get to the next presentation. So, are there any quick questions and questions with a question mark at the end? <laughs> yes. So, what would you suggest as a critical uh, atlas of the Is there one? 
There, there's not one, to my knowledge. I'd love to make one. I'd love to sit down and, you know, starting with some of the things I did, it'd be like, here's what an Elvish map would have looked like from this period, and here's what, you know, this would have looked like in that. Um, but so far as I can tell, nobody has, has done anything like that uh, yet. But if anybody knows of, you know, if there are, are fan maps that you know of that engage some of these ideas really strongly that I haven't seen, I'd love to hear about them because like, I think that would be really cool.